here with the Brentwood Genealogy Group at our local history room in Brentwood, New York. And we're very happy to have uh, Tim as our guest today. We first found out about Tim's work and we're so excited to have him here because we actually did a uh, program about Valentine's manuals and using them to research New York history. And when I was looking into it, I not only found um, Henry Collins Brown and his publication of the manuals, but Tim's investigations into Henry Collins Brown, who was his grandfather. And grandfather. Great grandfather, right? And uh, his republication of the upside of a breakdown. And this book, is uh, so fascinating, and it's all about how um, Henry Collins Brown spent so many years creating the Museum of the City of New York, but his setbacks in when it was uh, taken away from him. And him and I have talked about um, the book, which is, uh, even today, it's not only a great historical source, but it's so um, interesting and encouraging for our daily life, and also the genealogy aspects, because in rediscovering his great-grandfather, Tim has done a lot of genealogy research and rediscovered um, relatives that he didn't know about and all about Henry's life. So today, um, he's going to be joining us. He's going to tell us a little bit about his research and the book, and then we'll be able to talk to him and um, ask questions, and today's program will also be recorded so other people can uh, listen to our talk today. Thank you, Tim. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you for that introduction. It's great to be here, and for those of you who will be watching the recording, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, before, we, before we get going, I'd love to just hear everybody's uh, name, and then also um, so that I can can cover things that are meaningful to you. If you could just in a couple of sentences, let me know what you'd like to learn from today. Um, that would be a great way for us to start. So um, Peter, why don't you start? Okay. My name is Peter Ward. I am a uh, local history librarian here in Redwood, New York. I've been really interested in talking to Tim and uh, I've been interested in learning about what he's discovered about genealogy, but I've also found the ideas in the book itself really interesting, and I've enjoyed talking to Tim about the psychology in the book and his thoughts about that, and also, of course, its connection to New York history and the history of the museum, because Henry wrote so much about New York history. It's amazing to meet someone who really has a connection to all of these classic books. And I feel like we've been I've been learning so much about New York history and other things to explore just by talking to Tim. Super, great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I was gonna say, how about the red sweater? But you're also, you're both wearing red sweaters. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, my name is Angela. And I'm here today for the good company and the bagels. And um, I'm interested in knowing about the title of this talk. What is the upside of a breakdown? And um, getting a deeper understanding of letting go and knowing that there is a lesson in everything. Great, thank you. Thanks, Angela. My name is Jerry Brennan. Um, Jerry? I've been interested in genealogy for almost 20 years now. And I find that any, any presentation that I go to, even if I think it might not relate to me, I learned something. So um, yes, the title was intriguing and uh, I'm just interested to hear about the story. Great. And did you say your name is Jerry? Jerry, yes. Great, thanks Jerry. Great, and so we also have, I've invited some family members and then someone who I've met who's in the world of genealogy here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is where I live. Nancy, if you could just uh, uh, say what, what your name is and, and what brings you here today and what you'd like to learn, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And I'm jealous for the New York bagels. <laughs> Very jealous because they're better than bagels here. But uh, I am Nancy Kuharski. I'm a professional genealogist uh, living in Fort Wayne, as Tim said. I met Tim this past summer, just started up a conversation uh, discussing the book. And I have read it twice. I absolutely love it on 
a genealogy level. But even more than that, I love Henry's words on his journey of mental illness and bringing to light that it's not a stigma and um, the history. I get to New York City a lot and I look at it differently now since reading uh, Henry's book. I absolutely love it. And uh, genealogically, it's fabulous. And you're going to learn something no matter what. Thank you, Nancy. That's great. Chrissy B., what would you like to get out of? So Chris Brown is, so I have uh, two brothers and a cousin who I actually met as a result of this project who joined us. Um, so uh, Chris Brown is my brother. CB, what would you like? Your older brother, your much older brother. Go ahead, say it. <laughs> and what would you like to get out of today? Well, I just love the story here. You know, I, I met Henry, had a vision of him he was he was either 98 or 90 the year he died and i was about nine or ten years old i think and was just struck by how wizened this this old man was and uh, a little frightened it was a little scary looking at that point. <laughs> just great memories of hearing about him reading the book obviously several times and uh, for my birthday two years ago i took the whole family all my kids and a couple other relatives and friends to the museum of the city of new york and we had worked out a special tour just to, that where Henry was acknowledged, uh, although I thought a little reluctantly, but acknowledged as the founder of the museum. That's a whole other story. Just an interesting part of our family and also getting to meet some of our relatives, which has been wonderful. So that's I hope to get more information so, something so I don't know about you, Henry. Before you joined us, Chris just met his cousin Kate on this Zoom call. <laughs> oh, wow. awesome. Hello again, Kate. Hey, nice, how are you? nice knowing you for 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Kate, so as I'm, Chris and I are great grand uh, kids of Henry's. Kate is a grandchild of Henry's. So Kate, if you would just uh, introduce yourself, that would be great. Well, um, my name, I'm Kate Barrett. And uh, my grandfather is, is uh, Henry Collins Brown. And I'm trying, I'm, what I would, what I'm anxious to get out of this meeting are reactions of people who read this work for the first time. I'm trying to remember when I first read, I've read it a number of times, but um, I can't quite remember when I first read it because I read it with the original title, which to we'll me is the best title in the whole world, and I'll let Tim deal with all that. <laughs> but I'm just very interested to meet, and especially uh, meet two more cousins. That's, that's, a, that's a trick. And uh, I think <laughs> when I met Tim, of course, that sent me to all my photographs. I'm the archivist in the family. Nobody keeps anything. And if anything is kept, I have it. And um, so I went to all the photographs, and of course, we found everybody, uh, if you look uh, long enough. But I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm anxious to uh, hear your responses to the book and to what Tim talks about. Thank you, Kate. It's great to have you here. Doug B., are you, are you available to say what you'd like to get out of today? I am. Now I'm unmuted. Um, uh, welcome. Greetings from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Not the background, but um, I'm just having fun watching Brother Tim involve his life in this project and then also in the whole world of mental health and he's uh, uh, making a difference in the town that he's in and I think <laughs> across a larger scale so um, I'm going to be stepping away because this is the hour of my day where I do a qigong practice and so I'm going to be doing qigong and I'll mute myself but I'll stay on board and nice to meet everybody uh, Tim have fun thank you thank you great 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 well thank you everyone and I'm looking forward to learning from all of you as well, because uh, this project did not start out as a genealogy project. So as we get into the q and I'd love to hear your thoughts on even more of, of how we can get involved in family. But before we get going, I do something to start a meeting to just kind of get us in the moment. And I call it SBG. The S stands for smile. But give us a nice big smile. The B is for breathe and the G is for gratitude. So if everybody could just sit up nice and tall, we're going to do just three nice deep breaths in. First one in, take through your nose. And as I'm saying these words, think these things to yourself. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. And breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. Relax your shoulders. Breathing in. My breath grows deep. 
breathing out, my breath goes slow. One more time, breathing in. I dwell in the present moment. And breathing out, it is the most wonderful moment. We do that just so that we're ready to get together for the next hour and talk about whatever it is that we get to. And then just take a moment and think of something that you're grateful for already today. So I'm grateful to be here as, uh, as we start this time together. Um, this has been an amazing journey. And the journey is all around, you've already talked about, um, Angela and Jerry, you've talked about the title. Um, and the title is um, The Upside of a Breakdown, A Man, a Museum, a Mental Institution, and the Power of Resilience. What I'd like to do to start off before Peter and I get into talking about questions is to share um, the story of how this book came back to be, because the original book, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, is this book. So most of this book is actually from Henry Collins Brown. Um, and what I'd like to do is read, so you hear from me, read the back cover of the book. Here is Henry right here. Uh, and then parts of the preface, which is my love letter to Henry, and the foreword from the publisher of the book, and then hear from Henry himself to set the tone so that you can get a feel for why this project became a project again, and then also the original work of Henry Collins Brown. So here we go. This is from the back cover of the book, and again, a context of why. In 1937, my great-grandfather, Henry Collins Brown, shared his mental health journey with the world in his memoir, A Mind Mislaid. His story is one of triumph and the cycles of life. Henry was the human interest historian of New York City in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and the founder of the Museum of the City of New York. After a grueling journey to start the museum of one of the great cities in the world, he was cast aside for a younger man from outside of New York. This resulted in a full-on nervous breakdown and three years of recovery in Bloomingdale Mental Asylum in White Plains, New York. This is the remarkable account of his journey back to wellness. People still struggle with the stigma of discussing our mental health journeys, which we all have. Imagine the nerve in the 1930s. We are sharing Henry's story as a tribute to a great man who loved his city, created something great, the museum will celebrate its centennial in 2023, and was bold and courageous in his battle with mental health issues and his <coughs> to share, to help all then and now. Enjoy his story, Tim Brown. I smile whenever I read that last part of that last line, uh, willingness to share to help all then and now, Clearly, as you'll hear, as I share some of the book with you, um, Henry had a clear mission in bringing his story out. Little did he know that it would be uh, brought back out again um, uh, so many years later, uh, almost 100 years later. So that's the context of the back, uh, from the back cover of the book. Um, now I'd like to um, share with everyone um, the preface of the book, um, which um, I did not have any intention of publishing a book ever. I never thought of that, never came on my radar screen. So I had to do some research on how do you explain what it is that you're working on and you do that in the form of a preface. And so I'd like to share that with you now. Um, and I can remember like it was yesterday sitting in Miami in February of 2021. The book was published in May of 2021. I was sitting in a outside of a coffee shop in Miami, Florida, and I wrote this. And this is my love letter to Henry. Dear great grandpa Henry, my love letter to you. I remember hearing about you when family would gather when I was young. We probably met as I was born in 1957 and you went home to God in 1961. But I was too young to remember and you had a whole bunch of us rugrats around from your children's children. Your creation of the Museum of the City of New York has always intrigued me and how cool was what came to mind as I would reflect on this at different times when I was growing up. Little did I know how your work would impact me at the current stage of my life. I can remember like it was yesterday visiting the museum when I was young for some ceremony. And it turns out that that ceremony was, was, was introduced to me by Kate. She, uh, uh, she was able to tell me that it was the 50th anniversary 
Um, and so when we were at that ceremony, I remember seeing your name in the souvenir store being a, a souvenir store book being sold for the occasion. How cool, I thought again. You would be amazed at how we get our information today on the internet and the World Wide Web. The abundance of everything available on computers is overwhelming. More on this in a moment. My fascination with you and your work as a New York City human interest historian continues to grow. You might be surprised to hear that over the past few years, we spend time together daily as I read something that you wrote from your 30 plus books and from anything I can find about you or what you documented regarding New York City through Google on the internet. A mind mislaid is where I started. This is the original book. And as Kate said, the title is just amazing. A mind mislaid. Henry has and had a, an amazing sense of humor. Uh, and, and this was his way of sharing with the world. A mind mislaid is where I started, which led me to the Valentine's Manual, which as Peter said is where he discovered Henry. This is one of the Valentine's Manuals. Now the Valentine's Manuals were a book about New York that was put out every year in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. Henry reintroduced the Valentine's Manuals in 1917 uh, and then uh, actually 16 and then took it through to 1928. So Valentine's Manuals is where I then became um, more entrenched in Henry's stuff. And out of that Valentine's Manual that I just shared with you fell this. This is an article from the New York Times Magazine dated January 2nd, 1921. This piece of paper is 102 years old. It's so cool to find things that are tucked into a lot of the books that Henry, uh, that we have as a family from Henry. So from the Valentine's Manuals, I then discovered Brownstone Fronts and Saratoga Trunks, another amazing book about New York City history. And then I discovered from Ali Pond to Rockefeller Center, this book is all about the five boroughs becoming New York City. In this book, this actually was given to our dad on his birthday when he was 15 years old. And in it is inscribed to the gentleman of Argyle House with love and affection from your crazy admirer, the author, Henry Collins Brown. Amazing book about New York. Before I knew about that last book, from Ali Pond to Rockefeller Center, I spent two years leading teams on iconic art projects, the Rockefeller Center Christmas Tree Star and the Top of the Rock Light Sculpture at Rockefeller Center for the Swarovski Company. As a result of your work in documenting city history and as the founding father of the museum, and then my more recent work at Rockefeller Center, I feel very linked to you in New York City in special ways. So why bring back this empowering memoir about your journey with mental health? What started as an interest in a mind mislaid has led to amazement about your work documenting so many areas of New York City history at such a special time and in a unique Henry Collins Brown way. From stories of the centennial of George Washington's inauguration and creation of the Washington Square Arch, see the back cover here, that's the Washington Square Arch, which I learned about in Brownstone Fronts and Saratoga Trunks to the five boroughs becoming New York City captured so beautifully in from Alley Pond to Rockefeller Center. Your work is so entertaining and well done. Bringing it back to life has become a purposeful passion for me. Your story about your mental health crash and recovery is very inspiring. And I thank you for being so courageous in writing about it and sharing your journey. It is well worth hearing from many of us today. I hope you are smiling down on this project and this chance to bring support and healing to many again, just as you did back in the 1930s. With the help of family and friends, thank you, Tom Morris and Abby Sheramonti, here we are. As the Museum of the City of New York gets ready to celebrate its centennial, it is my hope that many more people who love New York will get a taste of your work as a craftsman, because he really was a craftsman, of New York history coming to life again to help us build the future from our past. With much love and affection, your great grandson, Timothy J. Brown, 2021. So that was the way I chose to uh, talk about the why and some of his work. What I'd like to do now is share with you um, a few thoughts from the publisher of the book. And he really was the inspiration uh, for this book coming back to life. 
the publisher uh, and the author of the foreword to the book is Dr. Tom V. Morris. Uh, Tom is a double PhD from Yale in philosophy and religious studies. Um, he uh, was a tenured professor taught at Notre Dame uh, for 15 years, and he left to become one of the most active public philosophers and business speakers in the world. He himself has written over 30 books on philosophy and, and current life, uh, and his company is called Wisdom Work, and they're the publisher of The Upside of the Breakdown. He, uh, he starts off his part of the book by talking and comparing Henry Collins Brown to James Thurber and E.B. White. He laughed out loud several times in the first reading of it and marveled many times more. In these pages, you have his story available once more. I encourage Tim Brown to make the remarkable account public again so we could benefit from its lesson in our time. The prose of the book flows on like you're having a lively conversation with a very smart and cultured man who has an unusually keen sense of humor in writing about an issue not normally associated with the attribute, with that attribute. Henry Collins Brown isn't reporting here on how he arrived at the idea of a museum to honor the past and growth of what quickly became the greatest city of the world or how the museum itself was funded and built, which are all fascinating stories in their own right. He's detailing for us the history of the city's culture where he did in other books and very well. He was the human interest historian of New York City in the late, 1800, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries and had some intriguing tales to tell about an era lost to the fog of history for most of us. But in this book, he's doing instead something very personal, both for himself and us. The original title of the memoir was A Mind Mislaid. It's an account of the author's nervous breakdown and three-year visit to a state mental institution, but it's unlike anything we might expect of such a narrative. The tale quickly becomes an unexpected story about self-control, a positive philosophy of life, and the emotional resilience we all need as we encounter the ups and downs of normal existence, which is often anything but normal. Wow. Some of the main lessons of the book are that we all need to let the past be past, learn to live in the new present, whatever it may be, gain and master the art of emotional self-control and be gentle with ourselves and others who struggle with times that in most cases will just be temporary however long they may seem at the moment to drag on. Time and positive energy can be transformative in ways we often can't imagine. We can back, bounce back from great difficulties, a human ability for transformation and restoration. The same world that has been taken from away, the same world that has taken away some opportunities that were important to us may yet bring us more other paths forward than we ever could have hoped for or ima even imagined. This remarkable man's book can restore your faith and calm confidence in even the most troubled times. I'm grateful that it is appearing in my wisdom work imprint for the needs of our day. Tom Morris, Wilmington, North Carolina. That is why Tom wanted us to bring this book back out again. He had no intention of thinking uh, or thinking about this when I asked him to read it. Um, and I'll talk more about the inspiration for getting started looking at Henry's work in, in, when, when Peter and I get to Q&A. So, those are hearing, that's hearing from me and from Tom Morris, the publisher. Now I'd like you to hear a little bit from Henry before we get into uh, Peter's questions. The book starts, the first chapter is called My Mind Crashes. And it starts with Henry's account of what happened. And on the very first page is an article that appeared in the New York Evening Post, April 19th, 1929. Now think about that, 1929. When the stock market was crashing, it was in between the two great world wars. And the New York Evening Post was founded by Alexander Hamilton in 1801. It's currently the New York Post. It's the nation's oldest continuously published daily newspaper. So the article, um, it actually starts with the title, City He Loved, Lost to Old Chronicler, Memories That Were Life of H.C. Brown Fate, As Dream of Museum Comes True, Now a Mental Patient. The article itself is amazing, um, and it talks about an author, a, a, a writer's view of what was going on. And Henry says after that article, to deny the truth of the story would be to destroy one of the fondest illusions of the dear public regarding nervous breakdown. Yet I fear that is just what I will do, much as I may regret it in the future. The personal, and here's how he gets into talking about the why. Why for him to bring out this story about his 
time with mental health, nervous breakdown uh, issues. The personal narrative related in these pages is by no means unusual. Most persons, however, who have gone through it are ever after strangely silent upon the subject. Apparently it does not possess the glamor, the exquisite charm, which seems to be the exclusive and peculiar property of, for example, an operation. Operations have been known to provide practically unlimited material for a lifetime of weird, though wholly unromantic reminiscences. Nervous breakdowns, on the other hand, have uncomplainingly taken the place with that pitiful figure in the old song, oh no, we never mention her or him. Not only does a recovered patient dread to speak of the illness, but looks upon himself as having brought disgrace upon the family. He would, if allowed, walk only in shady lanes and neglected byways, shunning the high road lest he be seen of men. There are, of course, occasional exceptions. I am one. When I returned to the world, as the hospitals naively put it, I made no secret of it. I spoke out frankly and freely. I wanted people to have all the ghastly details so that if they should afterwards conclude that I had been crazier than they had been led to believe, it would be no fault of mine. I even had the temerity to address several clubs on this subject. I took for my text, a mind that found itself. I shall always be grateful to the chairman of the first meeting. I'm going to introduce as our speaker this evening, he said, beaming upon the audience, the only man I ever knew who went crazy and drags about it. At the conclusion of the talk, a dear old lady whispered in my ear, I can see this happening. She said, don't go hunting for that lost mind of yours anymore. You might find it. Hang on to the one you have. <laughs> I love that. And then here is his explanation for the book. He says, the real reason for this book is the hope that possibly I may be able to show the world that a nervous breakdown is not necessarily the end of all things, nor is there any danger that you will never get well. You are in for a pretty bad time, you would be if you had typhoid, double pneumonia, or spinal meningitis. Furthermore, and this is the sad part of it, mates, you are here, right here, where you are, largely as the result of some damn foolishness on your own part. I shall enlarge upon this later on. There is absolutely nothing mysterious or supernatural about a breakdown of this kind. It has a definite reason for existing, the cause of which is easily ascertainable. In my own case, it was the loss of the Museum of the City of New York an enterprise into which I put the best years of my life, only to be robbed of the results of my labor and success just in sight. To an emotional temperament like mine, that was an overwhelming disaster. And then I lost it. A younger man was wanted. I was then 65 and without funds. The work that justified my existence lay in ruins at my feet. It was a day of unutterable woe. Had I been younger or had not come to the end of 10 years struggle, which had left me physically and mentally exhausted, I would have weathered the shock all right, principally because there would not have been no, there would have been no shock to weather. The museum would have stayed right in the hands of its creator and founder, where it belonged. My resistance had been weakened to the vanish, vanishing point. As a result of a long nervous strain, inseparable from such an enterprise, undertaken perfor perforce on a shoestring, and the old fighting spirit was gone. So when I was eased out in the favor of a younger man from the wild woolly west, who had never seen New York until he came to take charge of the museum, I just naturally crashed. But all is not lost. Delightful memories still remain. The joy of combat was mine and mine alone. So how he took that amazing struggle and turned it around really is amazing. So um, thank you for allowing me to share um, uh, thoughts of, of, of from Henry clearly, and then um, of what this, um, uh, bringing this back to life has been. Uh, it, it is, again, I never would have imagined that I'd be, have the chance to speak to you all, um, uh, but, the, but the real amazing part is the, not only discovery of family, but the ability to just, just have great discussions around mental health and how we just all experience different things at different times in our lives and in our days, and we need to talk about it, and particularly in these times uh, of ours today. So. I would love to, uh, Peter, if we want to talk about questions or take any questions or comments from, uh, from the audience right now, um, we can do whatever it is that you'd like to do next. If, if anybody has any questions, you can uh, ask them when you'd like. Um, I also um, wanted to start with a question of my own, if that's okay. I wanted to ask, how did you 
when you first really realized who Henry was and his whole story, what were some of your thoughts when you first discovered him? Oh, wow, that's a great one. So I, I've always known uh, that, that uh, you know, the name Henry Collins Brown, that he was the founder of the Museum of the City of New York, but then not much else. And uh, I would pick up a mind mislaid throughout my younger years, and I would read a couple chapters and put it down. And, and then I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to read it now. And this is like in 2018. Um, so uh, four years ago, and I just was blown away by his story. Uh, and I just couldn't put the book down. And I then realized that in 2023, did the math, uh, looking at some of his stuff, and I realized that the museum was going to be 100 years old in five years. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to present him in some way as an ancestor to, uh, directly to the founder? And that's when I started diving into his other work, Peter, and then became just blown away. And literally for four years, I have read a little something of his every morning and his, his, his history, the way he brought history to life, his writing style um, truly uh, captured me. And as a result, then I started meeting family. I've been in touch with the museum. Uh, the book came, I, again, I did not start reading Henry's, Henry's Mind Mislaid and his other books to bring this out. This was not even on my radar screen until my buddy Tom said, we need to bring this out. This was right in the beginning of the pandemic. And he said, we need to bring this book out because people need to understand that we all deal with stuff, we're, we're, you know, but we need, to, we need to work hard to become a, a, the best we can. And the first place is to talk about what's going on in our lives. Does that answer the question? I think so. Did, I, was, I was wondering too, did you feel when you, were in, when you were having this later reading, when you were really delving into all of his work um, and really reading a mind mislaid, did you... Um, Feel like there were parallels with your own life or did you feel like he was very strange and you were trying to understand him great great question thank you there have become real parallels now um i have at times had to work real hard on my mental health and my physical health to have good mental health so i spend a lot of time on my own personal development have since i was in my teens I uh, suffered a, 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 an exhaustion breakdown of my own when I was working with the Swarovski company, building all the amazing things we did in New York City. Uh, so very interesting there, right? The whole talk about mental health. And, um, and then I have found that I love to write, which I had no idea of. And I have gotten into poetry and I write poetry every morning for the last four years. So. I don't think I would have tapped into that if I hadn't tapped into Henry's amazing, um, amazing work. That is amazing. That's really cool that he even inspired me to start writing. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, and and a, and a story that goes with that is, as a kid, I couldn't read. Um, I just couldn't read, and I didn't discover that until many, many years later in my life. I just thought, oh well, I just didn't read all those classic books that my brothers read or other people read. Um, and I certainly can read now, but I just, I just didn't have that skill. And so to be able to not only read today and, 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 and to be able to write today, um, I feel like that's just been such a gift. I don't know if, I, if we um, talked about this aspect of the book, but I agree with you how, like, how encouraging it is to read and how it has so much good advice about um, dealing with Troubles like that and a breakdown and a setback, like using the museum. Um, but one thing we were I had mentioned was when we first reading it, he has the um, that very humorous tone you were talking about in the introduction. And um, so when I was reading it at the beginning, I was almost thinking, I wonder, I, I, almost, I almost wonder why Henry is in this terrible situation because he seems to be taking it well from his tone in a way. But then um, and Kate had mentioned what was your first reaction when reading the book. And one of the things I was thinking of was reading carefully and thinking what was, um, what was the real darkness of his situation. And reading through it, you realize um, just how terrible 
a blow losing the museum was. And the one part that struck me was when he said um, he would literally walk up and down his room all day pacing and worrying about the museum. And that I feel like was when I really understood and understood what an accomplishment it was to come back from that. You know, he, he, um, he was exhausted, uh, you know, from everything I can read and talking to family members, he was exhausted. And, um, and it was just such a blow. Kate, do you remember that time at all? When you, did you, were you old enough to know that he was gonna be going into the hospital? No, no. Uh, they did not, my mother did not talk about much of that. That goes with the territory, I think. I probably knew, learned more after reading the book. Yeah. And then, of course, our, our cousin Connie, who um, she is our, she's your, what is it? Uh, what are you, a second cousin? Second cousin? You're not removed, are you? Let's, 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 let's ask the genealogy experts. Yeah, so. what, what are we two together so I can be <laughs> right? So, so um, my grandfather was Kate's mother's oh. brother. So does that make us second cousins? We're the second generation. See, Connie and I are first cousins. Okay. Connie so, Brown, for those who don't know, she took she and her family took care of, of grandfather for the last what five, 10 years in White Plains. And so he they know him very well. Yeah. But no, I do not have I I was totally unaware of this. Nothing was spoken about it. And uh, what I learned started with reading the book. Yeah, and, but, but he went on to live another 30 years. So he you- He died in 99. Yeah. <laughs> he was 99. Yeah. I, I did visit him towards the end. I have uh -huh. that recollection. But I'm curious now. That was a, there was a part of the book where he says um, he laments having wasted three years and he wonders if he can make it up. So that was, that was another encouraging thing, seeing that he lived so long after the book and uh, made so much of his life. Well, and, and I, think, I think Connie once told me, Kate, that A Mind Mislaid became his most celebrated book in terms of people reading it. Well, I'm mm. sure. Pardon? I, 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 I don't know for sure, but... Yeah. I think she would, she would know. Well, and what's been really neat in terms of genealogy, I did not know about Kate. I think I do, I had a recollection of Connie. She and I had actually met one time in New York many, many years before. But when I went to the museum to tell them about the project, and, and again, the original start of me looking more deeply into Henry was to maybe someday when the 100th anniversary came about, I could present something or be there as a representative of the family for uh, the founder. And when I talked to the president of the museum, Ms. Whitney Donhauser, she talked about two, two other Browns that she'd been in touch with, a Chris Brown and a Matt Brown. And I said, oh, well, Chris is my brother. She said, no, there's two Chris Browns. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so she was gonna get their permission to connect us well with the Google and the internet. I went on the internet and I found Matt Brown. And I then, then uh, sent his company a letter and I got bounced to InfoAd or something. And, but then the second time I sent a note to his, his company, a Lucas Collins or Colin Lucas, Lucas Collins. Anyway, I get a note back from a young man and he says, I'm Matt's cousin and we're all related to Henry Collins Brown. Cause I was asking, are you related to Henry Collins Brown? And so then we, uh, I was introduced to their whole family, introduced to Connie. Connie introduced me to Kate. Um, uh, 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 and so we have, we've, we've discovered family members we just never knew we had. And Kate has been so, such a joy to get to know. Um, we, we've, I think Kate, we've talked about just about every month since we met 18 months ago. Um, and we did a real big project together in that Kate had a lot of memorabilia and books of Henry's we reached out to the museum to see if they would welcome them and put them in their archives and take good care of them, one of the conditions Kate had, and they agreed to. And so Kate has recently um, shipped off four boxes, I think it was. Holy <laughs> um, cow. 
of material to the museum. And I made a note this morning thinking about that, Kate, that we got to be back in touch and make sure that they're going to do something very good with that. Stuff. Well, yes. You have to be careful with the museum. I have a tendency, my, my lens at looking at all of this is much more as an academician rather than a genealogist. Though I really um, would like to know more of the genealogy side. But the museum itself does not have a good reputation as you obviously gathered from 1936. And so one, one has to be very careful. Yeah, and so um, we, we, we don't will- know their history, excuse me. They do not know their history. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so we're trying to bring that about. And, and I've been very persistent and I have met twice with the president. I've met with the public relations consultant that works for the museum, as well as people who work at the museum. Uh, but to Kate's point, they're not as they're not as interested in the founding as as you would think that they 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 might be. Well, they I don't know the whole history. My mother uh, knew it a lot better, but there's a lot of debate back then as to who really was the founder. There's no question in our mind who it was, and we were quite insistent. And at the fiftieth, mother was the one who represented uh, the Browns and. Uh, it's pretty clear and it's stated this way. They just don't talk about it. It's very strange. And and <laughs> sent me the actual letters that went back and forth from the from the president of the museum back then 50 years ago. By the way, here's another great, can you see this? There's a great picture of him. Um, That's super. And, and he, super had, great. he had such an amazing, amazing sense of humor. So this this is Henry uh, uh, later in his years, and it's a it's a note that that on the back of it is a note that was sent to my dad and his brother. This will give you so, another sense of his amazing um, his amazing sense of humor. So he writes to the heap big chiefs of Nershell, Junior and Augie Brown, who massacred General Custer at Little Bighorn, took the scalp of Will Bill, Wild Bill Hickok and scared the life out of Sitting Bull, Yellow Dog, and Ghost <laughs> Eyes in the Wood. Ugh. Both are 20 notch men and draw a bead faster than the eye can follow. They are tough babies and I can lick them both, standing on my knees with one arm behind my back. Jack the Swordfish Man. Imagine getting a note like that from your grandfather. <laughs> well, uh, Tim, I can add to that. I don't have them. But he used to send me postcards and sign them all Disney characters. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got postcards from Donald Duck and Goofy and all of those people. And I don't have those. I didn't know enough to keep that. Well, that's great. Well, um, and... and um, if you would, um, Kate, could you could you just share with everybody? Your mom was an amazing, amazing person in, in in so many ways. Would you mind sharing some of her her world, her life with everyone? Well, it's pretty hard to do it in a capsule. Yeah, I was just trying to figure out how to link it to. She was the youngest of the six. The span between the first and the Sixth is 15 years, so that's quite a lot. I guess the best thing to say is she was, she's a very famous literary agent and talent scout. And she originally, what do they say today, the breakout or breakthrough or what's the phrase? There's some phrase. Um, she worked for David O. Selznick in the 30s and was his East Coast representative and their job as a literary agent was to find stories that could be translated and developed into movies. And she was exceptionally good at that. And to tell you, and so her frame to claim is Gone with the Wind. And then she also discovered Rebecca and a number of those. And so that's, that's her beginning. And then as a talent scout, she, she was the agent for very, very famous people. I'll just give you a couple of them. Arthur Miller, she was his, her, his agent for over 30 years. 
Uh, she discovered Ingrid Bergman, brought her over to this country. And as I can say, the list goes on, but I'm trying to think she must have had some of grandfather's genes in her for all of that skill. I have, I have her Wikipedia page right here. Oh. <laughs> and she also convinced Alfred Hitchcock to yeah. sign a seven year contract with Selznick. That's right. Um, so he could direct Rebecca. Did you say um, sign Lawrence Olivier? Oh, he, well, I'm sure, yeah, he yeah, yeah. as well. And but, yeah, so amazing. How's her mother related to Henry? Pardon? How's her mother related to Henry? Daughter. Oh, uh -huh. nice. She goes under, um, she goes under the name of Kay Brown. I think I've heard that name too. Yeah, Kay Brown. Mm -hmm. And she lived She lived to be 93. 93. <laughs> yeah, was she in documentaries or? Oh, yes. Movies? If you, it's called um, Gone with the Wind, The Le Legend Endures. And it's, uh, you see it a lot on PBS, channel, our channel four. And it's the history, it's the background of Gone with the Wind and she's in that a lot. Angela, have you seen that movie? Gone with the Wind, yes. No, 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 uh, the, 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 the documentary. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, but the name Kate Brown sounds familiar and I watch a lot of PBS and documentaries and other yeah. that's, that's where you would have seen it because I think it's the only one she's in. But it's, it's, it's very interesting to see her on that film because she's younger than I am now. <laughs> so great. Tim, in your um, investigations into Henry, you discovered Kate just fairly recently, right? Yes, yes. So, so after the book came out and I talked to the museum and found out about Matt and Chris and, and Connie, Connie got me in touch with uh, Kate. So that would have been in the summer of 2021. So just a little over a year ago. And who was Connie again? Connie is first cousins with Kate. So she was just another one of the lines that came directly from Henry. Okay, that's great so that you've discovered so many people. And um, I wanted to ask uh, what other um, family history research have you been doing? Is there anything that you're still looking into or questions about Henry that you want to investigate? Oh, uh, it just continues. I would never have imagined even what we found out so far. So. You know, that's where I'm going to come to you all and say, what else can we do? And Nancy and I are having coffee next. I think it's next week, Nancy. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Week. Yeah, for, yeah, it's coming up. So, uh, I mean, goodness gracious, there's one line of the family that uh, I have not been able to account for. Uh, and that is um, Harry Collins Brown. So we have we so so as as Kate said, Henry had six children. John Crawford Brown, Florence Lorena Brown, Harry Collins Brown, Ross Ellsworth Brown, Catherine Brown Barrett, uh, Kate's mom, Henry Collins Brown, I'm sorry, he's in the picture that I'm looking at, and then Nelson Doubleday Brown. So Nelson Doubleday Brown, he is Chris Doug's Katie Brown, I think just joined us, our sister. Um, he, uh, he is our grandfather, Nelson Doubleday Brown. And, and there is a connection to the Doubleday publishing world, I, I believe there. Then Catherine Brown Barrett is Kate's mom. Ross Ellsworth Brown, we have, I, it's one of the other, uh, uh, oh, we just recently found another Brown through Chris finding someone on 23andMe or Ancestry.com. So we put together the pieces of Ross Ellsworth Brown and then uh, Florence never married. And then John Crawford Brown is, I think, um, uh, the Connie's line. And so we have not found anybody from the Harry Collins Brown line. So that is somewhere, um, Peter, that, you know, I, I, as time permits now, I would definitely want to try to dive into to find out if there's any relatives in the Harry Collins Brown line. So That's the only line we haven't found people in yet. How did you discover each other? Was it through... Um, Ancestry, 23andMe, those kind of things. Was it your DNA um, or all of the above? All of the above. So it started, um, uh, it started first with just hearing about a cousin from the president of the museum. 
and she mentioned someone's name I'd never heard of. I figured out he was in the computer world. I just did research online and came to find his company, sent a couple of emails. They didn't respond. And then I hear from a cousin who says, yes, that is your cousin. And then as a result of those conversations, I met Connie again. And then Connie introduced me to Kate. And then my brother, Chris, he did a DNA, either Ancestry or 23andMe, and just recently, in the last three or four months, found Jenny Brown out on the West Coast in California, who was a DA in Los Angeles, since retired. She's the most recent person we found, and that was through DNA, and literally, it's like three months ago. Wow, that's amazing. Are you guys going to have a family reunion? Well, the museum's 100th anniversary is next year. I, I, and a lot of us are going to do our best to get there and have a, a reunion of sorts. Well, I don't even know if we call a reunion, <laughs> a reunion Angela. I think it's going to be a, a union <laughs> for a lot of us because we haven't met, right? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, my maiden name is Crawford, so that's me. <laughs> but there are many Crawfords. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so this is a picture. This is a picture that I was reading the names from. Um, and and it's, you know, again, the family filled with humor. Uh, they're holding up. So there's Henry, um, second from your, well, right here. And the sign that is being held up, first of all, look, everybody dressed in a tie at a, at a family affair. The, the sign that they're holding up says, deposit all knives, hammers, and axes. <laughs> So this is when he was going through his breakdown? This would have been after. I think he is probably in his 70s or 80s here, from what I can tell. So this would have been after the family getting back together again. And from what Connie has said, again, Connie, our second cousin, um, all of his siblings helped out with the, with the expenses of his stay at the, at the hospital. Um, and then he lived a, a bunch of his last years with Connie and her mother in, in White Plains, New York. Did, um, and Harry, who is Harry in that picture? He's the one you don't know much about. Right, yeah. So um, Harry is um, right here. So that is, that is the family line that I would love help on from all of the genealogy experts here. Uh, how do we find uh, anything about him. And, and by the way, and, and this is where Nancy, I think you'll help me a lot. Uh, believe it or not, everyone, Fort Wayne, Indiana has, is it one of the top three, Nancy, genealogy departments? Uh, yeah, well, technically we are the number one public library in genealogy in the world uh, because Salt Lake City, the family research there, the family search dot org one is considered a private library so technically we are number one in the world and we are definitely number one in family history so we uh that's our little niche is to have individual books about people's genealogical work of their family so we, we you're gonna help me there nance <laughs> you better believe it oh you know i've got notes honey <laughs> All right, awesome. I love it. Kim, yeah, Harry's family, I have to double check that, but I think that's Priscilla, and I think we can help you with that. I don't have my stuff in front of me. Connie, oh, okay. Connie would know that. Okay, super. I'll find out. So don't, don't, Do you know the year Harry was born? Don't know. Don't have any of that information, Peter. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, again, to your point, I, I mean, there's so much, I just, I, I would love to, you know, document all this. Right now, it's, because the project has been so uh, amazing and, in so, and it's just taken me in all these different directions. Um, there's a lot of things that are, that are, you know, I was had just a blast pulling out all my files to get ready for our time today. Um, but yeah, even birthdays, I just don't have that yet. Here's another one of his books, by the way, that Kate so kindly gave to me. This is a book that is called Book of Old New York. I mean, it is a it is a huge, huge work. And this actually, once opening it up, and so a lot of the book the books that the family has, 
they're inscribed by Henry. And this one in particular, I just, I just, I love it. This book is number seven of which 494 copies have been printed. Now remember, a lot of this work was in the 19 teens, 20s, 30s. And the detail that he went to to print these books with color pictures and, 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 and uh, um, um, thin things to protect the color pictures. But what I wanted to sh uh, share with you um, here is that he actually inscribed this for his wife, <laughs> which again, his humor is just amazing, um, to Miss Kate Ross, that was Henry's wife. That's my name. Right, you're named after her, right, Kate? Mm -hmm. Um, to Miss Kate Ross, with the kind regards of a boy she knew, who is now the author. <laughs> um, and then, and then it's just this is just again amazing, amazing book. Um, and, you know, this is yeah, with with color pictures from back then. He he um, he has documented some amazing stuff. And as a result of, again, all of this work, I was introduced to a New York history, uh, a New York historian, American history memoir, Claudia Keenan. She's been in touch with the museum and Claudia is a, a historian of American education at New York, uh, New York University, PhD. She's taught at Emory Henry College and University of Virginia Extension. She is working on a book about Henry Collins Brown right now. And when she and I had some uh, a communication back and forth, she said to me, it's so nice to be in touch. Henry Collins Brown is a fascinating, neglected figure in New York City history. I've enjoyed researching and writing about him. So when that book comes out, I mean, it's gonna be so neat to find out what she found out. Oh, definitely. I'm very curious too to hear um, what's discovered about his life after a mind mislaid and what, what sort of things he did because that was so surprising to see how long he lived after that book. From what I can gather from my reading, Peter, is that for many years he went on, on the road to talk about his mental health uh, and, and the stigma around mental health. Um, the book itself was, um, was inspired by a magazine article that he wrote about his experiences. And he got, I, I can't find what magazine it appeared in, but he speaks to the editor of that magazine. I imagine it's a big magazine from the New York area. The editor just said, you have to write about this. You have to, you have to bring this story out to light. Um, and then, and then as, and then as I read before, he, he went on the road and he talked about it um, because he wanted people to know, um, clearly he was still talking about um, uh, New York City history, but he wanted people to know about the fact that we need to help one another um, with our emotional and mental health. I mean, again, imagine in the 1930s. Yeah, that is incredible. And hey, Tim, I yeah. think that's, um, and you've been, you know, touching on it a lot. And often when I, when I've read this book, I think his sense of humor and his positive attitude off of that, I think piggybacks off that sense of humor. Honestly, I think that's why he's able to, was able to go through what he went through and really come out victorious on the other end. And He's so passionate about everything he did, no matter how little it was. And, you know, writing a, a personal message on the back of a photograph to your dad that totally, you know, like you, you laugh and you're going, oh, my gosh, that's so great. Grandpa Henry, that is just so incredible. And I love how the book brings that out too. his humor, his positive attitude getting through hard things and like you alluded to earlier a message that we all need uh his book was great when it was written and it the words are still relevant and they fit into 2022 thank you nancy nancy as a, as a genealogist seeing henry's books like, have you ever seen something like such a great resource for looking into your family background if they lived in a <laughs> 
Oh, I, oh, you know, it's the information on this whole family and gosh, as I'm learning about the other family members today, I'm like, geez, Tim, there's six, seven books here on this family, each individual alone. Um, yeah, it's, you know, if you've done any genealogy, um, it's a rare nugget to have such a prominent, great, lot of information out there, um, person, unfortunately, most of us don't have that cool Henry in our family, um, or a great historian as Kate, thank God, save things. Um, but yeah, what a, you know, there's always more to dig. There's going to be things they're going to find out. And, um, I would, I would love to be able to have one fourth of the information that Tim and the family have on their grandfather, great grandfather. Um, it's, it's a genealogist dream come true. And it certainly is never going to happen in my genealogy, but uh, I, I absolutely think it's wonderful. So, but, uh, but again, there's always more digging to do. Uh, Tim, can I ask Nancy a question? Absolutely. What, <laughs> what, what struck me is I listen to some of the conversation because I come, I come at this more from an academic perspective because I've been working in a university forever. Mm -hmm. Where does genealogy and academics, how do they relate? Because a lot of the things that we get all excited about, an academic would say, well, I need to know more before I would even go down that path. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, you know what? I actually think you just kind of hit it right there. It's that commonality of wanting to know more. And anybody who is serious about genealogy, and, you know, I'm not, trying to say anything bad against anyone who's just kind of doing it half-heartedly or just a little hobby. That's great. Um, I always want to know more and I base everything in fact. Um, so I do not put anything down unless I can prove it, cite it, source it, everything. And I think academia is very much that way too. And we just crave that information. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I think they go hand in hand and I think they help each other. Um, because a lot of times, and, and every genealogist is different, when I write up a client's report, not only do I do the, you know, birth, death, blah, 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 the basic vital stuff, I put in a history of the time period of the area or what life was like for that ancestor in whatever time they lived. So um, I, I think we think very much alike, to be honest, because I there's there's always more to learn, and I want to make sure I, I want to know everything, everything about an ancestor. Well, there has I think it's a master's thesis. Um, mm -hmm. I did I don't know if Connie gave you that, but I mean it's a thick document, and it's all about his work being a trustee and all of the stuff that all of the the work in terms of the early times, I think. So Connie has that, you think, Kate? I got it. I have something sitting in my file cabinet. Okay. Oh. You wrote that. But um, there has been another book published about him that I don't know if Connie told you about it, but we all thought it was the worst thing that we've ever seen. And um, <laughs> we, were get, we were asked whether the museum should sell it. And of course we gave a resounding no. And I know that. Yeah, well, I'll catch you up on that a little bit. Uh, but this master thesis that you have um, in your files, Kate, is that, who, who wrote that, Peter asked? I don't know, hang on a minute. How great is this, guys? <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> See, I mean, I can't even tell you. I mean, all this stuff. About that. Me meeting Nancy, go figure how random meeting Nancy is, who now, clearly, I can't wait to be able to understand. Thank you all of what you know and how to <laughs> research more. But Nancy and I met because my wife and I helped out uh, the mayor's office here in Fort Wayne to home <clears throat> children that were here from Poland and Nancy and her husband were the organizers of it. And, mm -hmm. and then we meet at a, at a dinner and somehow genealogy comes out. I happen to mention the book and now <laughs> here we are. I mean, it's just so cool. Yeah. All just is coming together. I always told Steve that was the best thing out of that visit this year was meeting you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Tom, the it's Phyllis Klein. 
ridiculous. Does that ring any bell? Fine, no. Um, trustees and museum building. The early years of the Museum of the City of New York, 1923 to 1932. How do you spell Klein, by the way? K-L-E-I-N. Thank you. Phyllis A. Klein. And it's a master's thesis. Well, right? I don't know what it is. I'm just looking at it. Okay. And, um, I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Because um, when, when I, I can't remember how I got this, but it's, um, it's obviously a lot of work went into it. I don't know if it is or not, but. Um, Great. Uh, that would, I wonder, I, yeah, I wonder is, is uh, how big is the document, Kate? Well, we'll, we'll chat more about it. Cool. Yeah, don't, don't take time now. I would love to. Um, well, this is wonderful. I hopefully you, you all are, are, are enjoying having us find out more stuff here. You're making a um, I had one other question in one of the books. Can you look in the Mind Mislaid, the original copy? Because you have not mentioned that little piece that was in the New York Times. Yeah. Is that in that book? Yeah, it was it was the it was actually in the New York Post. Oh, it's, is it's, that what well I I read something, okay. I thought it was different. Uh, well, the only thing that I see is from, from a newspaper is the article that appeared in the New York Post, which I didn't read the whole article uh, today, but that opens up the first chapter of Mind Crashes. I don't remember a New York Times article. Well, it's not an article. It's just a little teeny bit. And okay. it was on a blank page and that's all they put. Okay, hold on. Let me let me look at the original. Because I think and it was talking about him. It was directly saying what happened. He was Yeah, Henry Collins Brown has lost his memories, the uncommon memories he lived by, and the memories of old New York that he marshaled in the easiest of prose for the pleasure of the city's best people. All the store of odd fact and anecdote that make the books about the elegant 80s and the golden 90s has slipped from the mind of the author, along with the strange lore of the old good old days that he revised as editor of Valentine's Manual. In this April of 1929, when the cornerstone of the city's own peculiar museum about itself is about to be laid, the man who dreamed this museum is a mental patient in the old Bloomingdale Asylum in White Plains. His mind is disarranged and scattered like the thousands of odds and ends of the city's past that will eventually be assembled and systematized at the new museum. Whether the scattered memories of Mr. Brown will ever be reassembled is a question over which the doctors shake their heads. The institution where he rests is backed by the same stalwarts of metropolitan society who helped to finance his curious research into bygone Gotham and to publish its fruits with the quaintest <laughs> of illustrations. Copper and gray. But the doctors say that Mr. Brown's interest in New York life has passed with his memories. For more than a year, his broken mind has been closed to all news of it. This sad twilight of the mind came softly over the eager chronicler of old New York at Christmas time, 1928, when Mr. Brown was about to deliver his annual lecture on the city's old time Christmas before the bright tree in the Fifth Avenue home of an international banker. Does that sound familiar, Kate? Well, yes, but that's not the one I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, but I'm that is, but that was fun to read. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I did as a child visit Gracie Mansions, which, which is where it first was. Neat. Mm -hmm. No, I'll have to look that one up. Okay. Thank you again so much for uh, for joining us today and, uh, and and bringing everybody. And uh, this was uh, really wonderful. And I I think this was a great talk. And seeing some of the discoveries I feel you're starting to make right here, like discovering that um, thesis. And uh, this is really exciting. I feel like you're going to make even more discoveries, Tim. Yeah, it feels like that as well, Peter. So I thank you uh, and grateful for um, everybody showing up today. And um, a Angela and Jerry, thank you for braving the weather there. Um, and if you do get a chance to read the book and you ever want to talk about it, um, the book is available on Amazon. Um, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to have you chat about it with me. If Peter has all my information. Uh, my website is be well, B as in just B, W E L L, with TV.com. Uh, and you can, you can reach me through there as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. See you. Bye bye.
Bye, everybody. This was fantastic. Uh, thanks, Nancy. See you in a couple of weeks. See you soon. All right. Thanks, Kate. Appreciate you joining. This was great. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, Bye now. The ones that I hadn't met before. <laughs> How great is that, too? <laughs> See ya.